took it on those trails in Moab, you know, with all the super built new Rubicon Jeeps and all right, that. Right. And this thing hung with all of them. Ah, I got some dirt. Here we go. Let's give it a shot. Yo! Okay, through the puddle. Watch that be 20 feet deep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is where these things really come into their own. This is what it was made for. Yeah, this is what it was made for. That's right, exactly. But we are flat out about 55 <laughs> miles an hour. That's you know, about funny. the most she'll give you. Welcome to that episode of Jay Leno's Garage. This is part of what I call my street grab series. I see something cool. I stop the guy. I invite him to come to the garage. Now, this gentleman's been here before. Always here about three, four years ago with a 959 Porsche. As you see, he has very eclectic tastes. This uh, appears to be a 1972 Land Rover. We'll find out exactly what it is. I understand it's a military vehicle. Uh, the gentleman's name who owns this is Alex Grappo. Alex, come on in, buddy. Good to see you again. Thanks for the coffee. Good to see a, you, too. He has a great coffee company out of, out of Denver, right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. And he sent us a bunch of coffee last time. It was great. Uh, well, this is a big switch from the 959. A little bit. It's a little bit different. What, have you always been an off-road guy? I actually do. And in fact, I, I grew up overseas, in fact, in a country where this particular vehicle has some interesting history. And so I've always just been attracted to the romance of vintage Land Rovers, um, as well as the capability and the history that's there. And what country was that, now that you mentioned That it. was actually in the Sultanate of Oman. Oh, okay, okay, oh, fascinating, all right. So this looks like a well-used vehicle, I guess. It, it, this actually had some military application, correct? Yeah, that is correct. And, you know, I, I often say, like, if this car could talk, the stories that it would tell. You know, one of the things that's tricky about some of these old Land Rovers is it can be a little bit hard to trace down the exact history right. because they produce so many in multiple variants that a lot of what we know about this car has come down to research and our best guess. So today, some of the things will come out as n what we assume to be the closest thing we can find to the truth based on the history we've been able to research. Okay, and if it could speak, it would be a language we don't understand. So. So that really wouldn't help us much. Yeah. And what do I they think, speak in Oman? What language is that? So the uh, language they speak in Oman is, uh, is Arabic. Oh, and it is fact, Arabic. Okay. Yeah. Um, this particular car, um, actually, we believe its history was primarily in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, there is some evidence that these, uh, what are known as XMOD Land Rovers, or XMOD, meaning X Ministry of Defense, okay. um, were stationed actually along the Berlin Wall. Oh, okay. And so we've seen some photographic evidence of these Land Rover Series 3s in the 109-inch wheelbase that were stationed along the uh, Berlin Wall. Hopefully on our side. Yes, yes. on the right side on of the, the wall. On the right side of the wall, yeah. You don't want to be on the other side of the wall. No, Correct. That'd, that'd be bad. Well, very cool. Now, if I are these six cylinder? Yeah, so this car features the 2.6 liter straight six engine. Okay. Um, the 88 inch wheelbase, um, which is the shorter model, um, were generally fitted with the four cylinder engines. And in fact, it was really interesting Prior to the Series 3, uh, uh, Land Rover, in fact, tested a little bit with the uh, with actually a Rolls-Royce four-cylinder engine. Okay. Um, but they found that it was too heavy, and they eventually went a different direction. Well, I've got a ferret tank over there in the corner. That has the Rolls-Royce or Daimler uh, six-cylinder engine. And is uh, that a diesel? No, it's a gas. Gas. And is this diesel or gas? This is petrol uh, as oh, well. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now, would this have had a machine gun or something mounted on it, or was it strictly just for patrol? So it's funny you should ask, you know, um, that's one of the things we've tried really hard to discover about this car is what its exact purpose was. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we are fairly confident in is that this is what was called an FFR model, meaning that it was fitted for radio. So in fact, this is what we see right here with this box over here. This was actually designed to mount high powered communications equipment okay. here into this so that it could communicate with you know other vehicles and, and people, right. uh, whatever its mission was. But back to your question, about did this have machine guns. One of the cool things about it is it actually still has the original gun rack yeah. behind the seats. Oh, so okay. you can still see that there, in fact, with I believe to be leather mounts. However, where this car gets really interesting 
is there is actually a version of this. Technically, it was uh, they started doing them on the Series 2 and the Series 2A, but they were known as the Pink Panthers. And it was a pink version of this car. And the reason they painted it pink was because it blended in with the desert. Those cars were typically mounted with between three and four machine guns on right. them, usually 230 caliber and 250 caliber. And those were specifically created for the SAS on missions in the desert. So Yemen, Oman, UAE, and I believe even in Jordan. And okay. I've heard some rumors of maybe Egypt, but given the nature of the SAS, we'll never really know right. everywhere that they <laughs> okay. were. And the fact that they're pink, that's not really going to threaten about oh it's a pain they should be okay and then take them by surprise well and the crazy thing is at first they they thought the idea was wild why are we painting these vehicles pink and it was they accidentally discovered this while they were doing some other mission where i believe there was a, an aircraft that was painted pink and when they were trying to find it in the desert from another aircraft, they couldn't spot it. And so they realized the pink actually camouflaged perfectly okay. into the sand, especially in differing light conditions, which is why the vehicles were painted pink. And in fact, they've become some of the most collectible Land Rovers to this day, just given the yeah. uh, really interesting history behind it. Now, is it possible to open this hood without taking the tire off? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's see what we got here. Looks all original. Now, uh, <laughs> what's all the rust? Was this in a salty climate or So technically, this actually isn't rust. This vehicle is uh, continues to be well used to this day. Right. Um, and in fact, we just had it um, in Moab, Utah. Oh, this is dust, isn't it? That's so this dust. is yeah. red dust from right. Moab, Utah. Uh, the car just completed the, uh, uh, the White Rim Trail uh, in Canyonlands, and so a lot of driving on the red dirt roads, right. pushed a lot of dust into the, the engine bay. And what kind of horsepower are we talking here about? A hundred and a quarter, something like that? Yeah, that's a little optimistic. Oh, you yeah? know, to be honest, this car is, uh, I think the factory horsepower that they quoted was 70. Oh. Um, with about 120 pound feet of torque. That feels optimistic most days. I think one of the hardest things about driving this car is that it is in fact extremely slow. Uh -huh. four, However, four speed or five speed? Four speed, and that's yeah. actually one of the interesting distinctions between the Series 2 and the Series 3, which this is, is that they moved uh, for the first time to a synchro mesh gearbox when they moved to the Series 3 Land Rovers. And what, and that was in the 70s? They didn't get synchro mesh until the 70s? Well, that's funny. Well, and keep in mind, Land Rover, you know, was sort of born out of the inspiration of the Willys Jeep. They right. wanted to take that military off-road technology and bring it to the average citizen. So this was, you know, when the Land Rover Series first came out, it was designed to be really a farm car, right. uh, almost like a, a replacement for a tractor in many cases. So the one thing I'll say on this is that what it lacks in power and torque, it more than makes up for in gearing. And right. so the low range on this, we found to be absolutely unstoppable and, and actually quite impressive. So top speed is what, about 55, something like that? Yeah, I've hit about 70 going downhill. And Off it's about cliff. It's yeah. about that time you begin fearing for your life. Yeah, yeah. So I'd say it's comfortable at 50. You generally don't want to go much faster. Is it all-wheel drive all the time? Or can you go out of two It is not. It's actually got a shifting mechanism inside that will shift it between four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive, as okay. well as low and high range. Okay. Um, it also, um, for its four-wheel drive system, actually features a, a center differential that um, still to this day works awesome. I've, yeah. I've off-roaded a lot of modern cars with electronic front and rear locking differentials right. and whatnot. And this thing with its uh, you know old technology center differential does fantastic. It, can it be front wheel drive also? Or is it just rear wheel drive? When you it's know, I'm not wheel? entirely sure of the torque split of what it's able to do. Cool. I will say I've been in situations off-roading. In fact, we are just in Moab. Um, we did fins and things over there with no issues whatsoever. And there were several situations where only the front or only the back tires had traction and it seemed to figure it out. In fact, uh, I, I was, to be honest, in a bit of disbelief of how well it did do. And it's drum brakes, probably, I guess. Or Originally, it was drum brakes. Right. Uh, that was one of the uh, life safety upgrades that we made to it, is oh, it does have disc brakes on it now. All floors uh, or just the front? 
all four disc brakes okay. and they work really well. Yeah. It's a fantastic upgrade, especially for this car where um, I put slightly larger tires than right, the original right. spec on it. Well, I like the patina. Let's, uh, let's close this up and, and take a look around sure. the rest of the vehicle. Now, something I noticed, the interior is interesting. You've got three seats in the front. Now, I've got a 1941 American LaFrance fire truck, same sort of setup. But on the gear shift, third and fourth are switched because when you're up and forth, the guy in the middle is going to just be, let's say, really uncomfortable. So the idea was you go uh, third down here and then fourth all the way up so it's out of the way. Uh, but this is just a standard H pattern, correct? Yeah, and in fact, the best strategy we suggest for whoever is sitting in the middle is to sit cross-legged. Yeah, 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 okay. Is this wider than a normal vehicle, or is it just the illusion because of three seats? You know, what's interesting is it's actually much narrower. Yeah. So the car feels very narrow, and it's one of the reasons that it does very well off-road is, and especially where we spend a lot of our time in the mountains of Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado, um, it does really well on those trails because it is so narrow. So I think it's part of the illusion, and you can kind of see it when you're following behind it on a main road, yeah. just how narrow the vehicle is. Oh, interesting. Does this windshield fold down or no? It does, and in fact, that's one of the indicators um, for this particular vehicle that's helped give us some clues about its history is that um, not only the fact that it has the FFR components, which is fitted for radio, like the box we talked about up front, but the fact that it was a soft top and has a folding windshield suggests that generally it was designed to be able to be easily transported by air, typically helicopter. And so, um, yes, the windshield does fold down. Um, and usually they do that to fit into lower transport environments. Obviously, the top has been down on this all the time because the dash is just bleached out to death, isn't it? It's pretty much sun damaged. Uh, we like to call that patina. Patina. Yeah. Patina. Exactly, exactly. What do these two here do? What's that? So the two levers on the side over yeah. here, um, this is what actually controls your airflow. Okay. So you're heating and you're venting. And it's a fairly basic system where you're either hot or you're atmospheric air. Right. And um, it's either coming through the bottom vent or a vent up top, typically to serve a defrost function. And imagine, are those tube tires? They are not, and these are actually modern BF Goodrich mud terrain tires. Oh, okay. But they suit the car very well. Yeah, they do, and they look like they they look like they're the original tires. Yeah, again, we I, <clears throat> I prefer to keep this vehicle in a state where it's proudly showing its age and history. Right, right. So we like to keep everything well, uh, fifty-one well years old. Yeah. Yeah, correct. And you know, once you're driving it, it still drives fantastic. The thing I find so odd is that the gas tank is under the seat. You have to take the seat out. To fill it with gas. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting process, and it's also exciting for the passenger to know that they're sitting on a bomb. On, on, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and and that's another sort of interesting feature of the car is they are actually built, and this one has it as well. Uh, the second fuel tank is not functioning at the moment, but they were built with two fuel tanks, okay. one under the driver's side, one under the passenger side. And what's interesting is on the Pink Panther ones that I was telling you about earlier, those were actually fitted to hold over 100 gallons of fuel on board. Oh, okay. So in fact, when you see the jerry cans on those models, those are actually typically filled with water for the occupants since right. they were designed to really serve several months out in the desert in covert operations. So fuel was all internally stored and then the jerry cans were typically water. Now, can you switch from one tank to another? On the, is there a switch on the dash? There's or? a switch actually, uh, I believe it's under the middle seat over here. Which is it electric you, or is it a, actually? You, you, it's a manual. Man, yeah, yeah cause manual activation. Because electrics can go out and that can be a problem. Correct. And you yeah. know, you bring up a really good point about this car, which is that you really don't have to be enormously mechanically inclined to fix things on this car or right. know what's going wrong. In several cases, you know, we've run into issues with the car 
and we can just look in and you know trace the problems back and you can yeah. kind of figure it out on the spot and it's meant to be fixed on the fly as you say you know? correct yeah. and, and again you know land rover gets a bad reputation some of their uh, early 2000s and 90s cars certainly didn't help with that <laughs> yeah, but really yeah. these back in the day and still this one to this day i mean this is the most reliable vehicle these I these are the most rugged these are the yeah, incredibly these are the ones robust and rugged vehicle and it just starts up every time whether it's minus 10 degrees out outside or 100 in the summer. This car drove through the two highest mountain roads yeah. in, the, in North America on pavement to almost 13,000 feet. Zero issues, didn't wow. blink. And I'm surprised it has a key ignition. I would have thought being a military vehicle is just two switches under the dash. And that's again, one of the changes of the Series 3 is yeah. in the Series 3, they switched from a push button ignition to a keyed ignition on oh, the Series 3. Okay. And by the way, you commented on the dash, that was one of their more sophisticated upgrades that they yeah. liked to market, was that this had a very civilized dash, right. as opposed to the Series 2, which was a metal dash. Right, right, okay. okay. Well, very cool. Can we take it for a spin? Yeah, I'd love to uh, go out for a drive. Yeah, let's give it a shot and see how she goes. Uh, let's see what we got here. Just pretty much standard. Yeah, and first gear is uh, all the way over is reverse, so it's kind of right in the middle and then push up. I That's see. probably reverse right there. I it doesn't have a reverse lockout on here. No power steering in this baby. No power steering, you get a workout. Relatively responsive. Yeah, no, no, you can't beat old school. The nice thing about it, too, is that you know you really get to work the gears in this car to get the, the power right. out of the engine. So you're always shifting in this car, which is kind of fun. Yeah, you know, modern yeah. cars are so, uh, they have so much power that you well, can- Well, there's a reason for old school stuff, you know, like we're in that Blackbird, you know that spy plane? I'm looking at the gauges and I noticed, I said, oh, I noticed your oil pressure gauge. You actually have a, a tube, a copper tube with oil to the gauge. And the guy said, yeah, that's because it doesn't break. It's not electronic, you know? I was talking about this to a friend of mine the other day. He got what he's, Electric toilets, you know, those ones yeah. that have, you know, does all the sprays, water, all this kind of stuff. He said, I love it until the power went out in my house and I realized I can't flush the toilet now for three days, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's electric. He was screwed. There's a great line in a Sherlock Holmes book where Sherlock Holmes calls electricity the high priestess of false security. <laughs> exactly. You, that is a really great saying. I'm going to yeah. steal that. Always remember, I lived in San Francisco years ago when I was just starting out, and we had the power go out, and it lasted over a day. Yeah. And I think I remember hearing, you're three days away from complete chaos. Yeah. The power goes out. I think the power is adequate. I mean, it's, like you say, it's not fast. But it's not slow, you're just using all the pedal travel all the time. Yeah, and the one thing that's nice too is the clutch is very light and forgiving. Yes, So I like teaching people how to drive in this car because it's such a forgiving clutch. Like the engine can get such low RPMs before it stalls. Right. Plenty of torque, so very forgiving. And the one thing I'll say too, in, the, in low range, I mean, it just feels like there's nothing it can't crawl over. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's so torquey. I mean, first is where third would normally be. Yeah. And then you go over that way. 
And it used to have a reverse lockout spring, so you yeah. can kind of tell. Yeah. But at some point it snapped and, you know, it makes it a little bit harder to find the gears. Does it have a horn? It does, it's on the stock. Oh. Oh, there you go. Got your lift master. You know, Steve McQueen used to have a Land Rover series too that he used to drive around LA. Yeah, right. Well, I knew Steve. Really? Yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I never. I might have seen the Land Rover. In fact, he was quoted as saying that one of his favorite things to do was to load up the series on a weekend with the dogs and his kids and head out to the desert. Well, he was a big biker too, so mm -hmm. I knew him more for the motorcycles. Marilyn Monroe used to have a series as well. Oh, is that right? She did. And I think for me, that's just one of the coolest things about the car is it's, you know, this was everything that... I think William Holden might have had one of these. The Queen of England was very famous for having yeah, several yeah, yeah. Uh, Land Rover series. And she drove a tank to the Queen of England. That's true. And she was a big Range Rover fan as well. Yeah. There wasn't a whole lot she didn't drive. And she used to like to drive herself as well. And she stayed in Buckingham Palace. You know, I, all, everybody else ran away, but she didn't. She was quite a woman during the war. She stayed in the valley. Another cool thing about this car is there's just something about looking over a tire on the hood that yeah. even if you're in LA, it makes you feel like you're on safari. Right. And you know, and, and, the, and the sill is way down here, which is what I like. Monica's the sill is up here, you know. Yep. Well, and of course, a lot of the car was, the body was made out of aluminum back in the day, yeah. which was quite sophisticated for that time. And again, one of the things you'll notice too is that this car, you know, because of the military setup, it was designed to carry lots of people and very heavy equipment. Right. And so as a result, this car rides extraordinarily stiff yeah. until it's very underweight or it's under load. And so it does ride a little bit stiff, but it was designed that way uh, for a functional purpose. But we are flat out about 55 <laughs> miles an hour. You'll also notice something interesting on here, which is that there is no tachometer. I saw that. <laughs> so it's the car is mostly driven by feel. Another thing that's kind of an interesting quirk of the car is that even though this thing was designed for the furthest thing from performance, yeah. it's actually quite easy to position your tire exactly where you want it when you're trying to go around a corner or whatnot. Now, is this so, a car or a truck? It's actually a great question. And technically, I believe they used to refer to it as a wagon, but technically today I think it'd be considered a truck. You could almost have another gear between third and fourth. You really could. I mean, gears are the one thing that this motor has that really needs <laughs> for it to work properly. You just put a brick on the gas pedal and take your foot off and you're fine. Pretty much. Yeah, once you get used to the gear shift pattern, it's fine. Yeah. And again, I love the clutch on this thing. Yeah. It's, it's very light, but especially too when you're in low range and you're off-roading, yeah. yeah. that light clutch, but it's still very grabby. So it's, it's very easy to off-road with it, get over obstacles and whatnot. And again, surprisingly, it was very good at technical off-roading, which I really didn't expect given that, you know, this car wasn't designed for that. It was designed for yeah. off-roading down dirt roads and muddy roads and up, you know, hills and whatnot, military, but um, once it got to Moab, it was very good on the technical stuff. It's fun to drive. I mean, you can't get anything this open anymore. That's what I was going to say. It's just, you know, and today's the perfect day for it. I know. You know, I know. A nice sunny day and, you know, it's really a nice convertible. And the nice thing about it, too, is that a lot of really nice cars 
they're so high stress. Yeah. And we talked about that with the 959. It's almost hard to drive that because, you know, if anything happens, there's no spare parts. Right. And this car, it's so low stress um, that it's it, it makes it even more fun to drive, especially if you're going down to the beach or you're going camping or something right. like that. You can get into it with dirty shoes. You can get into it with a bunch of dirty kids. It doesn't you matter. You don't have to polish it. don't have to wash it. Exactly. And again, you know, as you commented before, sure, a lot of this stuff is old and worn, but it still works great. So there's not really a need. And the, and the nicer it gets, then the more you have to worry about yeah, it. Yeah. And it's funny too, you know, of all the different new sports cars and hyper cars you can drive, this car still probably attracts the most attention. You know, like on the website, we'll do a Lamborghini or something and you get 600,000 hits, 800,000 hits. You do a tricked out V210 Datsun, 1.9 million, you know, because it's what most people know. Well, the other thing that's cool too, right, is that this car has cult following. Yeah. And for good reason, right? It's the history, everything the car represents. A lot yeah. of people want to talk to you about it. They want to ask questions. They want to know the story behind the car. And again, the yeah, cool thing is that this car has got a story. A Dr. Livingston, I presume, vibe to it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, the funny thing too is for a long time, these were just very basic utilitarian cars. Yeah. And, you know, very recently, like in the last two to five years, they've become very collectible and more and more yeah. people are trying to snatch them up and um, they're they're gaining in, in popularity quite a bit. But for the longest time, you couldn't give these things away. Yeah. And you know, the, as the overall Def Land Rover Defender market, which of course was the next evolution of this car, is, is that market matured, these cars have, have started to follow um, and, and, and kind of become more desirable with them as well. Have you got a jack in this car somewhere for that tire? No, but when I off-road, I throw one in the back. Yeah, yeah. I think a couple of people around here recognize you. Oh, they look like the, like the car. Let's see what our turning radius is. Oh, not bad, look at that. A little bit of tire rub there. Yeah. And again, that's one of the nice things about this car. Everything's so tough and bulletproof. Yeah. Kind of don't really worry about anything in this car. Nice little Alpha coming up behind us. Oh, that is a cool car. Beautiful. Hey, once you're rolling, she keeps rolling. It's a pretty relaxing car to drive. Oh, yeah. yeah. Can't really get up enough speed to have to worry about things. Although it gets a little stressful on the highway, so which is why yeah, I try I, to avoid I, it. I would imagine you want it, yeah. Nice two lane road is what you want. Yeah. Probably one of the coolest things about these vintage Land Rovers is that this was one of the cars that actually started the whole Camel Trophy. And the Camel Trophy uh, was these challenges that Land Rover put together to kind of market the vehicles where they would take them into some of the most challenging environments they could get them into. Right. And they took them all over the world. So for example, this was in one of the first, which was actually in Zaire, um, which is now modern day Democratic Republic of Congo. Right. Um, but they drove these, uh, I believe it was almost 1500 kilometers off road um, wow. through the Congo. And in fact, all but one car finished it and one they voluntarily uh, stepped out, um, uh, in, in, which is why I didn't finish. Ah, I got some dirt. Here we go. Let's give it a shot. Yo! Okay, through the puddle. Watch that be 20 feet deep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is the way these things really come into their own. This is what it was made for. Yeah, this is what it was made for. That's right, exactly. This is probably what it did a lot of along the Berlin yeah. Wall back in the day. It was just cruising on dirt roads that went alongside the wall. 
Well, it doesn't stall, it doesn't get hot. What more could you ask for? Right when I first got the car, I took it to a Land Rover specialist to be checked out. And they said, and I said, the weird thing is I keep smelling fuel. So he took a look at it and he said, yeah, it's because your carburetor is leaking and it's every time you hit the accelerator, it's spraying fuel onto the exhaust manifold. And I said, can you fix it today? He said, no, I think you should come back another day. And that was the time at which I realized I needed to take it to another uh, repair place. Right. Because if someone was willing to let me drive home in a car that was spraying uh, fuel onto the hot headers. Right, exactly. Probably wasn't a shop I wanted to come back to. And in fact, that was the first repair I learned how to do myself. I quickly figured out how to fix the carburetor and keep it from doing that. Just replace the gasket, is that what it was? Yeah, it needed a couple of things tightened up on it, a few hoses replaced, it was actually, but again, you know, having never done that on one of these cars, it was pretty self-explanatory when you got under the hood, and, and that's just one of the fun things about this car. How long ago did you get it? I've had this car now for probably about four years. Oh, okay. To be honest, it hasn't really required a whole lot of work. Yeah. I mean, it could use some fine tuning here and there, but other than that, everything major works fine. Not a lot of polishing the chrome or any of that. Yeah, oh yeah. Of course, it leaks like the devil yeah. everywhere it goes. But that's one of the uh, you know old sayings about it too, right? Is how do you know that it needs more oil yeah. when it stops leaking? Right, right. Well, I expect the perfect day to come by with this thing. Not too hot, not too cold. Just exactly right. It's a big change from your 959, which shows you're a true car guy. You don't have any particular feeling one way or the other. Just like everything. Yeah, you know, anything that's unique and anything where, uh, to me, anything that was purpose-built and anything that has history. And again, that that's one of the biggest things about this car that actually it does share with the 959 is this is a car that really helped shape the history of the modern four-wheel drives that we drive right. today. You know, they weren't the only person innovating when it came to off-road, but between the old Land Rovers and the old Jeeps, they really kind of led the way. Yeah. And a lot of the original innovations in these cars from the four-wheel drive system on demand, shift on the fly into four-wheel drive, that's pretty advanced technology back right, then. Right. And so, you know, both how it changed cars going forward and the role that it played in a lot of history just makes this car really special. Well, thanks for bringing it up by. I appreciate it, my friend. Thanks so much for having yeah, us. Yeah, next time, next time you get any interest, give us a call. Oh yeah, it's always a privilege to come by and share some of these stories with both you and some of your viewers as well. And good luck with your coffee company. What's the name? It's Drive Coffee. And right. you can find us at drivecoffee.com. Drivecoffee.com, we'll check it out. It'll keep you awake so you can drive this. See you next week.